So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to um, Fear in Dogs. Um, if you don't know your neighbor, you can turn and say hello to them. You're going to be here for three hours, so you may as well. Um, okay, so um, before we start, before we really get going in earnest, what I'd like everybody to do is to, you do not have to do this if you feel too idiotic, but ta Alta is not going to videotape this. Um, not you guys, anyway. Close your eyes and think of yourself as being a wild animal. You're a wild animal. You're a possum. You're a raccoon. You're a rabbit. You're one of the flight animals. Or you're even a coyote. Or maybe a bobcat. So you are a wild animal, okay? A human being comes towards you, and that person is walking towards you. What, as a wild animal, do you do when that happens? You know, you've all seen it, right? They move away. So now what happens if you are trapped? What happens if somebody has put you on a pole? What happens if you are caught in, the, in a garage? What happens if you're just, you know, you, you've hurt something and now you're trapped? What do you do? And we know what you do, right? But you're the wild animal here. And it's really important to feel that wild animalness about yourself. And now, not that anybody here would do this, but just imagine if somebody were to pick you up when you're scared, when you're terrified, and grab you by the scruff of your neck and shake you and get mad at you. What do you think would happen? Do you think you would be any less afraid of that person? Do you think you would be any less afraid of anything if somebody punished you? And I think that is you know, the essence of what we're talking about today. Okay, you can open your eyes again now. Okay? So we're going to be really talking about what is fear, what it is, how, how animals respond to it. The other thing I, I thought I'd mention um, is that back when I was growing up four bazillion years ago, you know, you, people had dogs. And dogs either bit or they didn't, you know. You, you learn to stay away from other dogs or, or whatever. There was a cocker spaniel that lived right next door that everybody knew that if you went near it, it'd bite you. So, you know, nobody ever went near it. Um, but the dogs were either good dogs or bad dogs. And if it was a bad dog, it disappeared. You know, in the case of in my family, my, do my dad would take it someplace. But dogs would just disappear. They were not perceived as valuable objects at all. And in fact, they were objects they were owned. Nobody, or at least not many people, actually cared about what they thought. These are captive animals. These are animals that domesticated themselves. They actually chose us. They domesticated us. Nevertheless, they are captive animals. They are slaves. They are always at our mercy. Um, you go to a dog park, and in that dog park are about five or six or eight or 10 or 20 dogs. And that is a fenced dog park. None of those dogs can leave. They are in a prison yard. So that's a really important thing to remember. The other thing to remember is that typically owners didn't care what slaves thought. Typically an owner doesn't care whether a slave is happy, sad, fearful, angry, furious. But now we do, because now we have a different relationship with our animals. They are now part of us. They are part of our family. So nowadays, and I think that's what has changed over the last 20, 30 years. Compared to when I was growing up, our relationship with animals is completely different. OK, so we're going to talk about fear. What is fear? Fear is, is an emotion, obviously. It's one of the really, really strong emotions. There's fear, rage, love very strong emotions. And all emotions originate in the amygdala. The amygdala is a little tiny thing in the back of your brain, in the reptilian portion of your brain. When I say reptilian, I mean that it is the most ancient part of the brain. 
all moving animals have the reptilian part of their brain, they all have an amygdala. All of them have a fear response. And we, and dogs, and other animals, are not in control of our amygdala. So, you know, if you're scared, you are, you, your fear responds to whatever stimulus it is, and then it kicks back into your conscious brain. So everything about the amygdala is all about just spontaneous um, exposure to things that are going on. I always think of, of fearful animals, a fearful dog is like being in a scary movie all the time, where you're going to go, ah, ah, there it is, you know? So I've got a client, a brand new client, um, and they, are, they have a 10-month-old uh, Labradoodle, darling, darling little dog, so cute, I don't even like Labradoodles, and this one is so cute. And he, has, uh, he was raised with another dog, he never was apart from the other dog, and the other dog was apparently a very laid-back Labrador. And the, um, the dog went from his home in San Francisco to Chrissy Field, to his home to Chrissy Field, to his home to Chrissy Field. It appears that this guy didn't get any other kinds of stimulation or any other kinds of exposure to anything. So this, this couple, this family actually, it's a husband, wife, two children, um, got the Labradoodle from these people, and they actually wanted to take a little bit more time to make a decision about what they were going to do, but the people wanted to go to Europe, and so they ended up getting the dog a little bit faster than they had wanted to. So they got this dog, and the first two or three days, the dog was just absolutely hunky-dory fine, um, sweet, loved everybody, really kissy-cuddly, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then after about three to four days, started on walks, <laughs> when it sees somebody coming. And, you know, Marin County is like the rest of the Bay Area. You're, you know, if you live in the hills, you don't know what's coming around the next corner because there's so many corners. So he'd be walking with his owner and he'd see somebody and boof, boof, just that, Not, no big deal. And they got a little bit worried, so they hired a trainer. And the trainer came out and said, well, you know, perhaps you should use a different kind of piece of equipment, which was actually very true. So they put him on a um, harness and I put him on a lighter, lighter collar, and that was good. And so for the next three or four days, everything was fine. And then about seven days in, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Then somebody came over to their house. The dog races up to the front yard, at uh, front door. And they were, they were terrified. They didn't, they didn't know that their dog was going to do this. This little 10-month-old dog, cute little thing. And so it didn't bite or anything. And, you know, like most people, they go, oh, it doesn't bite. <laughs> yet. You know, we always forget to say yet, because the yet part is very important. Um, and so they, they talked to the trainer again. The trainer said, well, you know, put the dog on a leash. I think that'd be a good idea. And again, it's a good idea. And he said that he thought that the dog was extremely fearful and that probably they ought to bring in somebody who had a little bit more experience with fear-based behavior. So I came in and saw them last week. And um, so by now they've had the dog two weeks. And the dog, when I came in that, the, uh, the door with my, with my daughter, who's um, my assistant right now, he, he just, we just stood still and he barked around us for you know, five minutes and then we finally went and sat down. And after that he was okay. He wasn't as bad as some of them are. I could get up and go to the bathroom and he wouldn't bark at me. But he still wasn't really good. And so this is a person, this is a first time dog owner. Never had a dog before. And now she's got this back basket case. And um, so my first thoughts were, this is not a good match for you guys. So I talked to her about the fact that it's not a good match, but you're looking at this little cute face with a little fuzzy head, and, and it's just adorable, and when, it, when it's happy, it's happy. And they said, well, we want to work on it. And I just got an email, so we've, I've got another appointment set up with her, but just got an email from her yesterday saying the dog got immeasurably worse. And one of the things we know about Fear-based behavior, actually we know about all kinds of behavior. When you adopt an animal, the first three weeks are the best. So that's when the dog's on its, on its good behavior. So this dog is likely to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse unless, something, unless we can really do something to fix this dog. That is fear. 
That dog is terrified. That dog is terrified of the unknown. That dog has no idea what's coming around the corner. And whatever it is, it wants to get rid of it. So most dogs that are fearful are like him. They do not think. They cannot think. They're operating out of their amygdala. So they're reflexive. They're reactive. They're overly emotional. They can't hold it in. They can't kind of get, to, you know, bring themselves to actually think about what it is that they're seeing. It takes them a long time to settle down and then to go, oh, all right, I'm okay now. So they also have very poor impulse control. And impulse control, this is the big deal in dog training right now. Everybody's working on impulse control. But impulse control is really important. And impulse control is something that dogs do not have unless you help them have it. So why do animals have fear? Well, it's very important to have fear. Without fear, you die if you're a wild animal. So it's a very powerful emotion. It is a very gut emotion. And if you, it triggers fight and flight. So if you're afraid, you're either going to run or you're going to go towards the threat, right? And, and that is that's what happens when, you, when you're afraid. You go one way or the other, depending on the environment. It's all contextual as to what's going on. If you're sitting in a theater and you're afraid, you just close your eyes so you're flight, you know? Um, so, but an animal that doesn't have any fear is likely to be um, dead. If, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a small animal, a rabbit, and you go up and you investigate the dog, you're dead. So it's, it's very, very likely that you will die. So fear is always with us. Not only is it always with us, but fear is also, um, hang on just a second. Can we put him, I'm going to put him on leash. He's driving me crazy. So fear, so fear. fear is an animal that has, that has no fear is likely to get killed very quickly. It keeps a, an animal a safe distance from, from another animal. So I'm going to talk about flight distance here. Flight distance is the amount of space that an animal needs in order to feel safe. We all are very familiar with this because we all see it, you know, when you're, when you're walking outside, you see it with birds. They're all, all, all going to be just far enough away so that they're going to stay very safe. In addition, um, I was, when I was coming in here, like all shelters, there are a lot of feral cats around here. So I walked in here and there's a feral cat right outside and the feral cat stopped and looked at us. I was walking in with Boo, and I moved towards it, and the feral cat moves a little bit away, and then I moved towards it, and he moved a little bit away, and then I moved towards it a little bit away. And so in the end, he could stay far away from me. There's no way I could catch that cat, right? Unless there was somebody else who was at the other side, and he didn't see the other person. So flight distance is really important. Domestication is the slow um, diminution in the amount of space an animal needs, in the amount of space an animal needs. That's all domestication is. Domestication is hereditary, and it is what animals do over a period of time where they will allow human beings to get closer and closer and closer to them, or they will get closer and closer and closer to the person. When an animal is afraid, the flight distance stays at a certain distance, and it does not close naturally. So one of the things, the thing we're going to be working on, as if with dogs that have, that have fear issues, is we're going to work on trying to decrease the amount of space an animal needs. In the end, that's what we're doing, isn't it? One of the things that I found interesting when I was at Wolf Park is how very strongly they feel that taming and domestication are not the same thing. Taming is taming an animal. So if I had, a, if, I, if, I, if I was a really good dog whisperer, or cat whisperer, or deer whisperer, or, or talker, or emoter, or whatever, then, you know, and I, I, could, I could make friends with one animal, and it was, say it was a wolf, I don't care. That is taming that wolf. That is not domesticating that wolf. If over a period of generation upon generation upon generation, the wolf becomes domesticated. That is actually creating an environment, a social environment, where the animal feels comfortable and the type of animal feels comfortable in my, in, within, my, um, within my range, 
you know, within my personal space. Which is one reason, I don't know if any, did anybody see Coppinger last week? Um, he was up at the Marine Humane Society, and one of the things he talks about is taking um, feral animals, taking feral dogs like Mexican dogs, and bringing them into shelters, and taking them away from their dump sites, and bringing them into shelters, and how we think that that's the most wonderful thing in the world that we can do, and how it probably is pretty awful. Because you are taking an animal that has, over a period of time, become wild, even if they were ever domesticated, and I don't know that they were, and trying to tame it. Not to domesticate it, to tame it. And it is not necessarily the best thing you can do for an animal. I mean, if you are, if you're happily wandering around the peninsula and somebody says, oh my God, those poor people who live down here, we're going to take them to the spaceship where we have a much better life. Um, they won't be able to move around very much, but boy, the food is really good and all that kind of stuff. Would you like it? I mean, we, we actually are fairly, usually fairly happy with the life that we have. So, you know, domestication and tameness are very, very different. Um, but the flight distance is even more important. So, what does fear look like in a dog? I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures, and I know that you're already very familiar with all these different postures, but it's still kind of interesting to do. Um, Let's look at all the body postures. Most of them are actually emotional combinations, most of the body postures. This is a drawing that was done by my daughter, and I really like it. Um, so this is bold or confident, and if you look at where the point is, you know, they're moving forward. All you really need to do, well, not all you really need to do, but one of the things you really need to do when you're looking at dog body postures is to look at where the dog's posture is. Is it forward or is it backwards? And you can tell whether the dog is bold and confident, or you can tell whether the dog is fearful, based on those two, two broadly different body postures. A dog that's neutral or interested is generally just kind of standing there. I've got pictures as well. A playful, flirtatious dog, you can see that the body posture is back, which it would be in fear as well. But it is, um, everything about it looks pretty, fr looks pretty friendly and pretty happy, with the flirty looking ears pointing forward. So a dog that's fearful, the ears are going to be pointing backwards. A flirty dog is going to be pointing for forwards. Now, this does not help with those people who have Labrador retrievers. Um, <laughs> or better yet, hounds. They, they can't even move their poor ears, you know. Um, a scared or worried dog is going to look like this. And a submissive dog is going to look like this. And obviously, this is, these are the broad categories. They look much, much, much more. Their behaviors are much more subtle than what we put here but at least it gives people kind of an idea. So a neutral or contented dog. Um, and I try to get a lot of different kinds of dogs in here in these pictures. If you look at this, this is a, what is this? Somebody tell me what this is. He had, his head was about that big. Honest to God, he, he could hold like five balls in his mouth at once. I think he was probably uh, an Old English and a bully, you know, one of the new bullies. Um, and he was, a, he was a great dog. He was really a nice dog. But can you see how relaxed he looks? His ears are relaxed. It's kind of floppy. His eyes, you can't see them very well, but they're pretty soft eyes. His mouth is slightly open. Of course, he is ho holding a, a tennis ball, but does, he looks relaxed, right? That's what he looks like. This is my Pomeranian mix, and she is relaxed. Her, she's standing on all four feet. She, her ears are up. She's just kind of looking at the world in general. Just totally relaxed. This is a golden retriever, and this is right before we brought another dog in. So this was when he looked relaxed. Immediately thereafter, he doesn't look relaxed. But right now, he's looking very relaxed. His mouth is slightly open. His ears are dropped. His tail is wagging gently down below his hip level. This is a very relaxed dog. <laughs> this was my dog Strider, and obviously he was sleeping after playing ball. Whoops. Oh, and there's, there's the two of them together. That's him, again. And this is contented. <laughs> this is a greyhound that belongs to a friend of mine. She calls that the roach, which is what it looks like. A dog that looks playful, flirty, or friendly. This is a really good picture of a flip playful dog. And this is actually a dog that was feral. So it's a kind of, it's, it's a, she's made great strides on this dog. But you can see that the mouth is open and it's ready to go. The dog is really ready to go. 
These are two dogs that are actually playing, even though they don't look like they are. But you can see by the fact that his ears are back, his mouth is open, but it's not all the way open, nor is it an agonistic pucker. They are, so they are mimicking fighting, but they are truly playing. And if you were watching them play, you would go, these dogs are playing. You wouldn't be saying that these dogs are actually fighting. Although some people will, because if they, they get nervous as soon as noises are made, um, they do get a lot very nervous. This is obviously playing here. This is a wonderful Rhodesian Ridgeback who is very nice to little puppies. These are two pit bulls that are playing. Again, if you look at the body posture, both body postures are back, but they're for, they've got forward moving heads, their ears are back, their mouths are not wide open in a nasty way, they're wide open in a friendly way. And this is a flirting pit bull. This pit bull is actually, if you look at her, her ears are all the way back. Her tail is, it was wagging quite crazily, like right here. And she just loves that stuffed dog. She just thinks he's absolutely adorable. Um, and she was playing and playing and playing with him. And this is the traditional play bow. Um, this was a um, Malamute, probably hybrid mix, playing with Strider. Strider is actually a little nervous here. You can see him pulling back and getting a little bit worried. And this guy is going to town on the play bow to say, I am not a threat, 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 I am not a threat. Some watchful behaviors. This is Strider waiting for me. He had separation anxiety. This is a great watchful picture. This dog is obviously watching out for something is his tail is wagging and it's wagging lower than his hindquarters. He's not unfriendly, is he? Could he change in a second? He could change in a second. This is a pit bull who's watching. This dog is watching. <laughs> Just checking to make sure you're watching this, that's all. Just checking. This dog is very suspicious. He's doing a direct stare right at me and he is absolutely watching. And this is Luke watching while he's on his tree. This is one of my dogs. An assertive dog, this is a boxer who is actually doing nose to nose with a stuffed dog. But he's definitely alert. This is an assertive dog only because if you, he, I was right next to him taking the picture and he was just, just sitting there looking straight at me. Does he look like he's nervous at all? So he's very confident, very forward. These are two dogs that are trying to figure out where the other dog is in the scheme of things. Both of them are relatively confident. One of them is a little less confident than the other. Which one is that? This one here. Yeah, a little less confident, just a little bit back. This one's a little bit forward. And this is Strider investigating a, a, a dog. He's actually assertive, but he's very calm about it. Okay, here we're getting into anxious and nervous. This is one of Robin's pictures. This is what we see when we see anxious and nervous. Everything about the dog drops down. So this dog is investigating the stuffed dog, head down, tail down, um, body posture back. Where's this dog gonna go? Away, right? So she's actually stretching out her neck to try to get to this dog here. And so what, what a fearful dog does, what an anxious dog does is they do, remember the flight distance thing we were talking about, so I'm going to use you for a second. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and I would run away if I were, you know, if I was scared. So this is probably one reason why we don't all run up to each other and hug. We all need, there was a study that was done, it, it was not a particularly scientific study, except for the guy who did the study was really, really good who said that human beings need 44 inches. So I don't actually, you know, check that, but it sounds right. Here's another dog that's really scared, really, really nervous. Um, ears back and down, dog is actually hiding behind the owner, looking away, doing a lot of avoidance behaviors. So the, the camera is this way and he's right there. So he's looking away from the camera, he's looking away from me when I'm taking the picture. This is a dog that's anxious and nervous, and it's a little harder to tell, particularly with a golden retriever, it's a little harder to tell because their ears are down. But you can see, I, you probably can't see very well, but this one, there's a big gash right here where he got attacked by another dog. 
So he is very anxious. His eyes are worried. His, his mouth is pulled back. His commissure is all the way pull, pulled back. This dog is worried about the world. And this is actually is such a good picture because of the fact that it's hard for people to tell sometimes what, what a dog feels. And if you're, if you're seeing this, you know, how, how dropped the ears are here, how the, uh, the eyebrows are like, you know, worried and the commissure is pulled back, the only reason, well not the only reason, one of the reasons it's very important is because if this dog were cornered, what might it do? It might snap, right? This dog is also very anxious, the eyes are dilated. Um, he, he was a little feral dog. He was, we had three of them, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And I think this was Dewey, who was my favorite. I really loved Dewey, I wanted to take Dewey home. But you can't take them all home, as those of you who are, you know, volunteers or work at a humane society know you can't take them all home. So he's worried and he looks worried. And one of the things that makes him look worried is his mouth is closed. Think of your own dogs. How many of you guys have fearful dogs? Quite a few people. Okay. Um, fearful dogs tend to either have their mouth wide open as they try to bring more, inner, more air in or they close them. And when they're closing them, it's called an intention movement. They're closing them, getting prepared to do something. They are also closing them because they need to listen. And when their mouth is open, <laughs> they can't hear as much as when their mouth is closed. So it's a really good way to tell whether or not a dog is actually thinking about doing something naughty or thinking about running away. This was my little Pomeranian mix's his mom and she was like this a lot. She obviously is very scared. What does she look like she might do? She looks like she might bite. Even though her mouth is closed, as I get closer to her, her eyes dilate some more, and she, you know, her ears are back, and she's looking directly at me. One of the things about fear is that when you're afraid, you look directly at the thing that's making you afraid, right? So, if there, if there was a great big huge monster standing right behind me and I'm still talking and I don't know that he's there, where are your eyes going to be? They're going to be right behind me, right? And I'm going to be thinking you're not paying attention to me, but really it's because something's going to take my head off in a second or whatever. So we always look, a animals always look at what is making them afraid. Um, unless they have time and they can actually move their head sideways and avoid. But a really fearful animal will look at what's scared of them. This is a dog that's a fearful dog. This is a fearful bull terrier. He's actually in the process of attacking me. Um, but you can see his, his whole body posture is backwards. His actual you know, bull terriers are hard to read, as you know. And the, his mouth is being pulled forward as he's going, his mouth is going into an agonistic pucker. Um, his ears are up and he's ready to go. And he, he, the only reason he didn't bite me is because he had that. <laughs> So he had a leash, which was a good thing in this case. This is another dog that's very fearful. This dog is actually a great picture of a fearful dog. His mouth is closed. His ears are back. His eyes are almost popping out of his head. They're, they're dilated, and he's staring directly at the object that is making him afraid. And that happens to be a stuffed dog. This little chihuahua is trapped and afraid. Okay, so this chihuahua is actually in a crate, and I'm coming closer to her with the camera. Her eyes dilate, and again, they look like they're going to pop right out of her head. Um, and her mouth is closed. She is actually going to open it in a couple seconds and start to growl at me because she, as she tries to push me away from her. But this dog is terrified. Can this dog think right now? No. So getting into, trying to get a dog to think when they're scared to death is an impossibility. You just can't do it because, you know, it's like trying to get us to think when we're scared silly. So, you know, it's just not. And then here's a very scared dog. And this dog, you can't see that the, um, that dog is actually snarling, but you can't see it here. I can see it right here, you know. Dog that's fearfully aggressive. This is a bully dog, and his mouth is puckered and forward. His ears are forward, but his body posture is back. So, you know, sometimes you'll go, 
you'll actually be talking to somebody who says, well, my dog is really aggressive. And you go, and they, they, they go, he's, he's confident, or they just say he's aggressive. Because the word aggressive is a horrible word. It covers too many things. Um, and you say, is he fearful? And he doesn't look like he's fearful. Well, a lot of times there's that that's going on. The dog is actually fearful. It's just that you can't see it because you're looking at the face instead of looking at the entire body. By the way, if a fearful dog bites you, it hurts just as much as if an aggressive dog bites you, you know, a confident dog bites you. So, you know, that doesn't mean you go close to him. It just means that the motivation behind the bite is different. And this dog. This dog is about this big. It's a little teeny itsy bitsy dog. But, um, boy, he pack a wallop, you know. And he's actually, you know, he's so scared. His eyes are so wide and his mouth is so forward. So he is definitely going to bite. This is another picture by Robin, and I wanted to do the whole body posture. So again, backwards with mouth forward, ears down. This dog looks pretty friendly. Just going, you know, it's like we, we talk to people all the time. Well, he just wants to meet you. He bark, 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 long, 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 long. Oh, he's really friendly. He just wants to meet you. And you're going, yeah, okay, well, I don't want to meet him. <laughs> Not right now, maybe later. Maybe some other time we could do that. And here he is. Oh, this is the agonistic pucker. So this is when he's really thinking naughty thoughts. Um, and I do have his video. I don't know if some of you have probably seen this video before, but it's a really good video for watching fear in action. This is offensive rage. This has no fear in it, okay? This is a dog that wants to kill another dog, as it turns out, not a person. Um, and she's actually doing, what do we call this? The... Uh, What'd you call this, Pam? This this face, the mask. It's a it's a you know African something or other mask. Doesn't it look like that? Okay, here's another one. She's he's actually going to bite his owner. He's 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 actually thinking about it a lot anyway. This one is a great one. People don't think of golden retrievers like this. Can you see whatever is going on in his face? See see how forward he is. His tail is wagging, by the way, because dogs wag their tail even when they're angry. They don't stop wagging them when they're angry. They keep going. And he's got this agonistic pucker going on where his mouth is pulled forward, and he's doing what I call the devil, the, the, the devil lick. Tongue, it's not a, tongue flicks are usually fearful. In this case, they are, they're like little kids going, you know, it's a devil look. And then here's a healer, same thing, going after a dog. Forward movement, agonistic pucker, ears all forward. This dog is angry. This dog actually wants Strider to drop a pig's ear, which he did. He went, okay, fine. <laughs> I don't want that at all. And she did it. Here's another one, same thing. This dog is telling another dog, I want you to drop something. And the other dog dropped it. Okay. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, this is this should be formal, informal rather, not formal, obviously. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I will be repeating the questions because Alta is videotaping here. So, if you have any anything you want to say, please don't hesitate. Okay. So some of the things that we see in a fearful dog, besides the forward-backward movement, dry panting. <laughs> Hair loss, erection, which is just hackles going up, um, dilated pupils, dogs looking from side to side, a dog that's avoiding, ears pinned or twitching, urinating or defecating. That's really common. Um, actually, it's not really common, but it's common enough so that I've seen it happen even in my office at work several times if a dog is very fearful. As the, the body gets rid of, tries to get rid of all the flotsam and jetsam, the body says, I got to get rid of everything because I'm going to run. So they, it uh, gets rid of all the hair, gets rid of anything that's in the bowels and bladder. Stretching. I didn't have this one in here, but going to sleep is a sign of stress, of long-term stress, just going to sleep. So sometimes, uh, particularly in a kennel situation, you might see a dog that tends to sleep all the time. That dog's in shutdown mode. It's going to sleep because it's really stressed. 
Okay, there is a subtle difference between when a dog has its ears back when it's relaxed and when it has its ears back when it's um, fearful. When, it's, when the ears are back when they're relaxed, you can actually see the muscles have, have make, it make them relax. So their ears are like a little bit to the side and possibly a little bit to the back. When they're afraid, they're pinned. So you can actually see them holding them back. It's one of nature's ways of making or trying to make sure that their ears are actually held, made, kept safe in, in case of a fight. It probably also streamlines them, you know, for, for running away. More signs of stress or, or fear could be both. Tail held under, a drop tail, which is just a worried dog straight down. Licking, lick sores means stress on a regular basis. Um, lip licking, rigid posture, whining, yawning, pacing, and genital checks, where the dog looks, keeps on looking back at its own genitalia to kind of make sure it's all there. Um, no, I don't know why they do that, but anyway. Okay, so. I get a lot of calls from people saying that their dog has anxiety, particularly separation anxiety, which a lot of people think their dog has when the dog just has general anxiety, which can be easier to fix in separation anxiety, and fear. And there are, dif there are definitely differences. Sometimes the way you treat them are pretty much the same, but it's good to know the differences between them. Fear is very specific. It is aimed towards just one thing. I am afraid of, and you see this in dogs, right? You see this and they don't like tall men with beards. They don't like black dogs. They don't like German shepherds. They don't like kids. They don't like bicycles. Whatever. But there's one, they delineate between one thing and another. And one of the things that, uh, you know, when you're working with people, it, you ask is what kinds of things set your dog off. Uh, so fear is very specific. A sound can be very, very frightening for a dog. Just um, one of the sounds that is the most common is the sound of a, a fire, um, not a fire alarm, the, the beep telling you that the battery is, needs replacing. Anybody here got a dog that's scared to death of that? We have actually, you don't know where I live, so it's okay, we have actually taken out all, the ba all of our batteries. <laughs> because we don't want to have that happen. I mean, I'd rather have a fire for crying out loud. They'll wake me up. Um, you know, so... That's a really common thing for dogs to be afraid of. Um, one of the things about sounds, um, sights as well, but more sounds, is that it's not the actual sound itself, it's the unpredictability of the sound that makes them go off, that makes them afraid. It's the fact that they can't predict when the next one is going to go. So if you had a, um, a smoke alarm and it went beep, 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 they'd get really tired of it but it wouldn't scare them to death. But because you have no idea, and they have no idea when the next beep is coming from, it's always startling. And because it's always startling, it causes fear. Can you see that, how that might be? In fact, we can think of examples within our own lives, I'm sure, where something is, happens that is not uh, predictable, and that makes us feeling a, get a lot more fearful, or a lot more nervous. Um, than, than we would otherwise. It's one reason why dogs that live in suburbia are so much more prone to fear, anxiety, and nervousness than dogs that live in urban areas. Because in urban areas, they are essentially flooded with the sounds all the time, and sights for that matter, whereas in suburban areas, they are unpredictable, and they just pop up every once in a while, and that is what scares the animal, because they can't predict what's going to happen. So if you have a fearful dog, your very first piece of advice I'd say to you is make, try to make sure that the sounds that your dog is hearing are either, if you can't cover up the sounds of something going on outside, um, if, you, if you can't you know, uncover it, like make it quiet, cover it by turning the TV on or something like that, because that is much more, they'll get used to that much more easily. When I was, my first career was as a radio reporter, and back in the day, we used to have these machines that spit out news all the time, the teletype machines. And uh, you'd be in a room with like eight teletype machines, and they make all this noise. And within about 10 minutes of getting into the newsroom every day, you wouldn't hear it anymore because it was just a, such a constant noise. On the other hand, if somebody turned them off, we were all freaked out, anybody who was in the newsroom at that time. 
So, so fearful is very specific, anxiety is very general. The dog is worried about the environment and his safety in the environment. So now he's, he's just concerned about everything. So this is the dog that's like this. Constant. Just scanning the environment. Really being anxious about the environment. So generalized anxiety is something where the dog isn't always worried about his environment. Always always thinking that there might be something in it that's not safe. Separation anxiety, or specific anxiety, but separation anxiety is when a dog is afraid of being alone, or is nervous about being alone, or anxious about being alone. So this dog is anxious, and the next dog is going to be more fearful. Hey, Roke. So she's worried about her entire environment. She's also doing a lot of avoidance behaviors. New um, handler again. Boy, this floor is interesting. Gosh, this floor is interesting. Her ears are pinned back. Can you see if the muscles are holding her back, her ears back? Of course, her eyes are really wide. You can see the whites of her eyes. Her mouth is closed. She's really, really, really nervous. Somebody afraid she's going to get bitten? Yeah. Notice I'm the one holding the camera. <laughs> she's not growling. Nothing. So stiff. Yeah. Hang on a second, I'll get to Kristen in a sec, okay? In the stiff posture. So she was doing this just for the video. This is not something that, we weren't putting this poor dog under pressure just for the heck of it. It was because we were doing a video on it. So generalized anxiety. This dog is worried about the entire environment all the time. Okay, so your question was? This person knows it because she's very, very experienced with dogs. If it was a normal person, I would not. Um, oh, the, the question was, how does a person know that the dog is not going to bite? And it's, it has to do with experience of the person. So I would not, if I, uh, this is when I was working at the shelter, I would never have a naive person handle that dog. Um, this is the director of animal care, so she knows what she's doing. And if she gets bitten, she won't tell anyone. No, 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 no. <laughs> I won't say that. Uh, yes. Okay. So the question was, is this something that the dog is, that the, the dog is getting desensitized to it, or is the dog just kind of coping? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. The dog is coping. You're not, you're not able to desensitize at that level. Remember what I was saying about when a dog is afraid, when, when, when you're in the middle of fear, you can't learn anything. So all she's doing is going, I will survive, I will survive, I will survive, I will survive. That's all. And she's just kind of really holding herself together. But this is not a training tool. In this case, what we were doing was evaluating this dog. What was interesting about this dog is that she was eventually um, adopted by someone who was the finder of the dog and uh, she's a veterinarian and I saw the dog I think probably oh I don't know about a year ago and she said oh I remember I remember I, I, I adopted Rogue and I said oh how is she oh she's fine everything's fine I said oh really that's great she said she's out in the car I said bring her in she brought her in <laughs> she was fine in the home and, you know, she's fine in the home, but no, she's not fine. She, she can't get over that generalized anxiety. It's very, very difficult for, to do that. So, now the dog, this is the dog that you saw a picture of in a minute. So this dog is really more fearful of something very specific. And this dog is actually, in, you know, with regard to your question, this dog can learn. So it's probably not an optimal place for this dog to learn, but it can learn. So can you see the dog is aiming directly at me?
Mm. Okay, so I just yelled at the dog. It's not supposed to do this. No, it's, it's, it's just doing it because it's... Okay, so what happens with this dog, as you can see, is she actually comes up to me. He, rather. So as soon as I back up, this is a really good example of space. And what I'll do is, well, we're going to be taking a break at 2.30, and I'll, I'll, if I've got more of these, I'll load them onto the computer instead of being on this disk, and then you'll be able to see it, okay? But essentially, he actually comes up to visit with me. So he was really, really scared. He snarls. He, t he says, get back. I actually went, no, no, bad dog. He growled and snarled at me. Then I backed up, he moved towards me. This dog actually wants to be friendly. He wants, to, he wants human beings. He's really domestic. And, um, and he came towards me. So this is a very specific fear. This is not anxiety. I mean, it's probably got some anxiety in it. I think every emotion is all mixed up with other emotions. This is the, the, the question was, what happened the next time I saw that dog? That dog actually was like a lot of, of others. By the time we'd gone and taken him out like three or four times, his tail was wagging, he was happy, he had stopped being so afraid. So his behaviors became much, much better. Now, I don't know what happened after adoption. You know, it's one of those things that we just never know. But, for, um, but for the, from the point of view of going into the run and getting him back out again, he became much, much better. And he, first of all, what happened is that the, the, I could go in and get him, and then another person could go in and get him, and then another person could go in and get him. And by that time, he began generalizing, and so then almost anybody could go in and get him. But if you walked into him like this, forget it. He, wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna let you do that. So, um, so what happens to an animal's chemistry when it's afraid? Um, fear causes adrenaline to flood through the dog's system. So you know that. Just imagine you're walking, you're, you're driving on a freeway, and there's a near miss, and you have to do this. What happens? Poof! You know, all the chemistry in your body completely changes as your, as your body gets ready for fight flight. Unfortunately, it's too late. But, I mean, if you were going to be in the accident, you would have probably already been in the accident. But even so, you can probably turn the wheel or whatever you need to do. We all know what an adrenaline, flood of adrenaline feels like. It's not, there are, there are dogs and there are people that are adrenaline junkies. But for most of us, it's not a really good feeling. For most of us, we'd rather kind of get rid of it. But that's what fear does. And for a dog, it's exactly the same thing. It prepares the body for fight or flight. At the same time, cortisol is released. That's a stress hormone, and that sticks with the body. It doesn't go away. So it had the, the current studies have shown that it can take up to three days for cortisol to leave the system. So you get this little black dog, right? And he's, he's, in, this, um, he's in this horrible situation in a, in a kennel and all that kind of stuff, and people are coming up and wanting to poke him and prod him and all that. And he's got the adrenaline that is, is causing the, the anxiety, and rather is causing him to behave in a, in a somewhat aggressive fashion. So that goes away, but the cortisol is still going to be there. And when you're trying to train a dog, you do not want to train the dog when the cortisol is high either, because you want to train a dog when it's an optimal training circumstance, if you possibly can. And that means the dog is in a fairly relaxed state of mind. So. You know, would we try to train a dog who's in a situation like this? No. What we try to do is make him comfortable. If we make him comfortable, then he might be able to be trained. If a dog is fearful all the time, you have a really, really hard row to hoe. Because now you've got a dog that automatically goes into fear very quickly. And, and their cortisol levels remain high, and that can cause long-term health problems as well. Um, so things that cause a dog to be fearful, temperament or learning, both. Can a dog be born kind of fearful? Yeah, you bet. Um, it's a genetically uh, very, as I said before, it's, it's, it's a 
a thing that you're never going to get rid of in every litter there will be one dog that's a lot more fearful than the others um, and that that dog might have been the one that survived you never know because that one might have the highest flight response some puppies are born fearful and cautious some are made fearful by poor socialization in our society right now no don't <laughs> um, no we can't turn it off in here we've tried to turn it off in here so um, so the, the, in our society, people tend to take on everything themselves. You know, if you, if you work with, with clients or, or whatever, you know that people say that I have had the dog, I got the dog at, at eight weeks, what happened to it before to cause it like this? Not probably a whole lot. If you got a dog at eight weeks of age, there probably was not that. That didn't really occur. So there's probably a lot of genetics in that. But if you get the combo of, of, of genetically fearful plus lack of socialization, then you have a real icky situation. So I've got a new client, I haven't seen them yet, and they got a dog from the Humane Society up in Marin. And I know the dog, it's a, it's a very sweet dog, but it has got some fear issues. And she said she would like me to come and help train the dog, and I said, that's fine. She said she really wants to take advantage of the, the, the shelter's um, obedience classes and whatnot, but not until after the dog's had its shots. And apparently her vet told her that the dog needs to be four months old before she can actually take the dog into um, to, to classes. So here I am, back where I hate being, you know, where you're trying to say, well, the vets are really good and they're trying to solve their own, they, you know, they, they don't want the dog to get sick, but we don't want the dog to be bad. So Yes, as long as you're really careful about it, you can socialize your dog before four months of age. And then they go back and say, well, the trainer told me, and you go, because they only hear part of it and the part that you didn't want them to take home with them or whatever. So puppies can be made fearful by poor socialization. And adolescents like some are co that, that suffer from trauma can become quite fearful. Um, and trauma is something that is in the mind of the dog, not the mind of the human. So a dog that is nailed by another dog and there's no damage done to the dog, not done, done to the attacked dog, it does not mean that their brain was not damaged. All it means is that their body was not damaged. So if you have a dog and you are, and the dog is, uh, is already fearful and you put the dog in a situation where the dog is likely to become um, traumatized or is likely to have some kind of episode that it might not look favorably upon, don't. You know, try really hard to keep that dog safe because that's not going to do the dog any good at all. There are some people who still think that a dog should learn by doing. There are still a lot, you know, and they should. But you have to be careful if you've got a fearful dog already. So this is the other thing, okay? The fearful dog can be very friendly, affectionate, and fun when she's comfortable. So the people with the Labradoodle I was talking about, these really nice people, they said that, you know, the dog is just wonderful at home, except for when guests come over. So in other words, this dog is absolutely wonderful when it's just the family home and the dog can predict its environment. But at any other time, the dog is not okay. At any other time, when a dog is walking, when the dog's in the car, or when there are visitors over, the dog is not okay. The, it's like aggression. People go, you know, they say, say things like, does this dog look aggressive to you? And I'm looking at this dog, it's wagging its tail. Of course it doesn't look aggressive to me. But I'm not putting the dog in a position where it feels like it has to be aggressive. So they're, you know, they're thinking that the dog is aggressive or is always reactive or whatever. And no dog is ever always anything. They're just like us. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're friendly, sometimes they're bored stiff, sometimes they're sleepy, some, you know, whatever. So it can be any number of things that can cause this. So there is a genetically determined response to stress and fear. And um, dogs that are active defense reflex will go towards the fear, towards whatever it is that's scaring them. And dogs that have a passive defense reflex will go away from it. That's, those are very two broad, broad, broad character, characteristics. So you've got a dog that's got some fear issues. And when somebody comes over, it races towards the door. And it barks and lunges at the person coming at the, in, into the door. 
it's likely that dog is ADR. It's not absolutely positive because the dog may not behave that way if it's not in, a, in its own territory. But it's likely that that dog is like that. What we like to do with fearful dogs is we like to have them teach them to choose to, to flight, flight. We like them to choose PDR. We, that's what we want them to do. And of course, you're trying to work against genetics there, which makes it difficult. So their choices are freeze, which is the decision process. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I guess I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go that way. To run away, to fight, or to tend befriend. And tend befriend is just let's make let's make friends. Okay, we've got buddies here. Let's let's make friends. Um, fear is also the reason for a lot of phobias. Things like. Uh, panic disorder that is caused by fear. Some OCD behaviors are caused by fear plus stress. And so you get some, kind of some wild and crazy behaviors out of the dog. Some of them are not, however. Many of them are not. So fear shows up the most in territories with de defending the known, which is one of the things that we do too. You know, if you're in your house and somebody comes up the driveway and you don't know them, your immediate thought is not, hi, I'm gonna open the door and offer you a drink. The immediate thought is, who are you? And whoever you are, what are you doing in my house? Or what are you doing in my driveway? So a dog is likely to do exactly the same thing. So they're going to defend the known. So even a PDR dog is going to act in an ADR fashion, sometimes in their own home. Outside of the territory, it's fear of the unknown. Fear of what's gonna go coming around the corner, fear of what is um, gonna pop out of the ground, all those things. And then with strangers, human or canine. So what have we just covered here? Everything. <laughs> you, co you covered everything. Again, the only time that they're not afraid is when ev everything is completely predictable and they are in their own home. So it does not show up in a known comfortable environment. So fear is a, the most common cause of aggression in dogs. People don't read the signs well. People think that uh, fearful dogs are dominant. We have someone to thank for that. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. And we also have people think that dogs that bully other dogs are fearful. And actually, they might be right. It could be that the dog started bullying another dog because they were fearful. And then they kind of went, wow, look at this. I can, I can build my own confidence up by bullying other dogs. And so they become a paper tiger. And um, that definitely happens as well. So we've got socialization windows, which are really important to, if you've got a young dog, to try to, um, try to make sure you don't miss, but they, get, they do get missed. Um, the first window is, the first two windows close at four months, and that's when the ra most rapid brain growth has taken place. So if you can get them out and about, even in a front pack or whatever, by the time they're four months of age, you're really helping the dog. You're helping them learn what's going, what it goes on in their world. Um, and uh, then there are sensitization periods, and I should have put an S there, I'm sorry, where everything out of the ordinary can cause lasting effects. So here you are, you've got your adolescent dog and you're wandering around with your adolescent dog and maybe you're on a trail that you've always been on and a branch has fallen in the road. And the dog, who's kind of a spooky, so sensitive dog to begin with, goes, And this is a dog that yesterday could have passed this with no problem at all, and today is going, there is something in the road, and I am really, really scared of it. And you're going, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with this. And so if you're like a lot of people, you drag the, leash, the dog, dog up to the, the thing, and you say, get over it, you know, because it's just a stick. It's not anything bad. It's, it's fine. So that dog might be in a sensitization period, and they do not know when they are going to occur. They usually last about three weeks, and during that time, there are periods of very rapid growth in the brain. The brain, the teenage brain is still growing. And so if, if they learn something at that point, they're gonna, it's gonna stick with them. They're not going to forget it. Remember how short their lifespan is. So they're learning a lot more in a lot shorter period of time than we do. And they have a lot less time to kind of get over it. So they can learn good things. 
They can learn, for instance, that in the case of my ner nervy turvy, she could learn that the people who were scary before, which were teenage boys, are not scary. Or they can learn that things are really scary. They can learn that, that the sound of a bee is scary if they get stung by a bee. They can, get, they can learn that you know, a, a, a tree can be scary. They can learn all kinds of things are scary. Most of the time they learn that other dogs are scary. That's what they generally learn. Or they learn that people are scary because you've got a friend who says, oh, dogs all like me, who probably is saying, like the trainer I talked to, or not I talked to, I heard about the other day, who said, nobody's, dogs all like me, I've never been bitten, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to um, break that uh, record now. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, you think? You think? So in, in, the, in my case, it was a healer that came running out, and I didn't know that, I thought he was probably going to, he was probably going to bite me. But the trainer actually had said, I've never been bitten, and I'm sure he's not going to bite me because I'm not going to break that record. He bit him. He, he bit him. And I said, did he draw blood? And he drew, drew, blood, drew blood because this is a really scared dog, and the really scared dog is going to respond to that. So you can see that that dog, say that dog is an adolescent. We don't know. But say that dog is an adolescent. He's now been taken to the Giants game, which I'm sure is just a wonderfully controlled environment <laughs> where you can predict everything that's going to happen under all circumstances and then this guy does this kind of stare directly down at the dog causing the dog to get very um, nervous and he held the stare yep. and that's about as bad as you can get you don't even want to do that with a person you know the whole old saying about the, the dog blinks? I mean, not the dog blinks. When the person blinks, who blinks first? Mm -hmm. That's what that is, you know? It's, it's, it's this. It's <laughs> She's going to bite me in a minute. <laughs> and I don't blame her. I have, I have intruded into her space, no more 44, 7, 44 inches here, and I'm staring directly at her. And if you don't think that the dog is going to bite you, you're crazy. You know, most of them won't because most of them are, too, are, are nice. But obviously, some of them will. The nice, the cool thing about a, a St. Bernard is they don't give you any warning. You don't see anything. They're not one of the dogs that goes <clears throat> first. They just go boom, <clears throat> and they gotcha. So um, anyway, that was just a little thing, something there. No, you can't. We're not doing you yet. Okay. Okay. So yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. cool, on the sensitization periods? Yeah. Well, essentially, the brain is, is that they wanted to know what the sensitization periods were and how long, it, and they believe they're three weeks long, but I don't think that there's been any real proof that they, they are. That's just what they say. This goes all the way back to the Scott and Fuller um, information from back in, what, 1960-something or other? Because that, that was the most comprehensive study of, of dogs that, that has been done. And um, so essentially what happens is because the brain is growing, no, new neurotransmitters are being created. And while they're being created, all the new experiences are brought into the brain and used as a basis for future behavior. After that three-week period is over, they store that behavior, and then, or they store that information, and then they very, mal, very well might use it. So you, what you'll see is you see a dog that kind of is taking everything in that might be traumatized much more easily, and then, then they settle back into the dog that you knew before. So they kind of start off one way, again? and then it happens again. It ha can happen like two to three times in that first. Oh, uh, so the question is, or the comment is, it's kind of like growing at different, le at different levels in, in a, as a physically. Yeah. yeah, that's probably something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anything like penistiitis with it, though. Yes. Okay, so... The behavior of the little dog, he actually, you couldn't see it in because the, the, uh, the video was not playing very well, but he actually went into a submissive grin where he smiled and then he moved back into a snarl when I yelled at him. And the submissive grin, with a submissive grin, what he did is, it, it's, it, you know, I had to look at the video to be sure. I don't think I would have said, oh yes, that's a submissive grin because it was surrounded by all these other behaviors. It would take a better behavior consultant than I am to do that. But 
what you look for is the softness in the eyes, the head going down, the tail starting to wag a lot more, and you know, even though it's way far down, and then you watch that head duck, and then they do the, the grin. But not all submissive grins are the same. Some of the herding breeds do this great big wide smile, you know, so they do a very different one. Yeah, you're looking for, you're looking for soft body and the, and the head ducking. But when they're aggressive, they can also duck their head. They drop it. So, you know. So fear leads to aggression when a dog feels intimidated. That was a really good time to play that video. Um, if the dog feels trapped on territory, being approached by another dog, being approached by a person, or hugging, those are all things that lead to aggression. You can see that this dog is not happy, and this hand is approaching him. Right there. That was Binky. Binky, Binky was, was an amazing dog in that you could actually turn his aggression on and off. All right, so the progression when a dog is, 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 is going to, you know, is, is, his dog is fearful, is it goes from anxiety or fear to avoidance to escape to aggression to shut down. And that's just the progression that dogs go through. And we do too. So this is a Mastiff. Let's hope that this plays. Um, this is a Mastiff that is, you can see some avoidance going on here. So avoidance. There's a nice tongue flick. More avoidance. He says, that dog is too still. Watch his tail. He really doesn't trust the world, does he? Would you have bitten too? So look at the tail going up there. Would you say he's nervous? Yes. Yeah, he's a very, very nervous dog. Would you say he's going to bite? How nervous he is. So he's going to bite. I mean, I don't know whether he did bite, but he, if, they, if, if it kind of went on this way, he would actually end up biting. Because he was so nervous that putting him, put him in a territory, particularly because of his type, because Mastiffs have a tendency to be highly territory, he might very well decide to, to bite then. This is a, uh, a fear aggressive chihuahua, pit bull, mix. Hi. Hi. Put that puppy. Doesn't it look like a chihuahua pit mix? So the fear, dog, dog is going backwards, the ears are plastered back, looking straight at the fear object, straight at it. He's so afraid. Okay, so that dog is so afraid that he would not investigate the stuffed dog, even though the stuffed dog was on the ground with a calming cap over so he couldn't stare at him. He was so scared. Yeah, that was the owner on the left. And actually, the owner was a, it was a, they were, they were, you know, I'm just bringing in a dog to see what's going on with the dog. Um, so I bring in the stuffed dog. The owners are great people. All these people who ask, you know, I ask them if they can videotape, they're all wonderful, wonderful owners, and they all worked really, really hard. Now, with that particular dog, the, the behavior modification that we ended up doing more than anything else was, was really management. That dog was so terrified of almost everything that he started to live, or she, I can't remember now, started to live a very restrained and constrained life. And she did well in that. Um, we just, we had to take surprises out of that dog's mi life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to say, okay, this dog cannot handle surprises. So we have to make sure that the dog does not have to deal with surprises. 
but we also have to make sure that the dog's life is worth living and it's not just in a cage or something like that. Okay, so sometimes this is a Rottweiler that turns into a bully. <coughs> So these dogs, with the, with the stuffed dog, they're actually responding to the fact that the stuffed dog is staring straight at them and is very still. So those two things are, are extremely important with regard to this dog. Now he's plastering himself against his owner and he says, well, now I'll show you. <laughs> now that my owner is right here and is going to back me up. So then I put the t thing on the ground and he goes, well, now I'm really going to show you. So some dogs actually kind of go, well, I've been pretty stupid here. But this dog. <laughs> and he does this final rough. And there she is. And then he goes, you know. I showed him. Again, a wonderful owner who actually did a great job with this dog, making sure that the dog was in a very safe place and that was no, presented no danger to anybody. Okay, so those dogs are all, you know, like they're afraid, right? That you saw that they were all very fearful. Then there's the there's conflicted dogs, and what a con conflicted dog does is a conflicted dog can't figure out what to do. And so they're actually, in a way, they're kind of more dangerous in, because they'll go back and forth and, um, and they'll be friendly for a second. These are the dogs that you go over to your friend's house and the dog goes and, and greets you at the door by barking and people go, oh, if you just stand still, it'll be okay. And then we'll toss some treats or whatever and, and, and then walk very gently to the living room and sit on the, on the couch. And then when it, let me know if you have to go to the bathroom. Because if you have to get up and go to the bathroom, then the dog's going to go, Kunk, you know, and bite you. Or when you come back from the bathroom, they go, whoa, 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 who are you? It's somebody else. But they become very friendly in the meantime. So they're, they're fine, they're kind of okay, and then they're not okay, and then they are okay, and then they're not okay. And it makes it hard, very difficult to deal with the dog because they want to be friendly, but they're afraid. And I think that there are probably people who are like that as well. Whoops. Uh, there it is. So they won't approach it uh, like a fire hydrant there. They oftentimes won't approach it, but... Okay, so this is a very conflicted dog. So it's backing up. Okay. Want to squat again? It's okay. Well, you could do it there. Now there's a... Okay. <laughs> now, Ever know anybody who tells you? Go ahead and give the dog a treat. Do it again. Can you do it? What? This is one of our evaluators. This is not just a. This is not a random guy. I think I did, but it it split with. Okay, and squat one more time. I'm going to come in again. Okay. Let him relax for a second. Ready? Yep. <laughs> Just came back in again. Just moved back in. All right. Go ahead and give him a treat again. Come on. So over the next five minutes, a little, yeah. this dog became very friendly with that guy. And then he got up and left because he had to go back to work. And then he came back in again and we had to go through the entire process all over again. 
So you could see, can you see he kind of wanted to say hello? He wanted to actually engage? He certainly wasn't doing what a wild animal would do, which is to go into a corner and just hang out there. He wanted to come forward. He wanted to meet the guy. And when he did, he immediately went into conflict because he's too close. Now he's going, all right, now I'm so close. And he's going, you know, he's way too close. So he actually would do better if we worked him from, a, from afar. This is not training, by the way. We are just doing, we're just experimenting to see what his parameters are and all that kind of stuff, okay? Yes? Well, in the, in the second half, we're actually going to get into behavior modification. But yes, this is one of the, the you know, what, you, what do you decide to do? What do you do when you've got a dog that has, has this kind of behavior problem and you would like them to like people? You, would, you want them to do that. It would be very nice if they did, but they may not be able to. All right, so with regard to conflicted dogs, I should have just finished this up, but I didn't. So conflicted dogs are very deceptive because people think that there's, they think the dog is going to get over it really fast um, because the dog is good so often. And many times what happens with conflicted dogs is, and in fact with fearful dogs as well, as anyone that they have made friends with when they're still a puppy, when they're under five months of age, they stay friends with. And they know that person really well. So they might bark when the person comes to the door, but as soon as they come in, their tail's all wagging, they're all really happy. And the same thing is true with dogs. A dog that they met before they're six or seven years of age, a, a months of age, the dog is fine with, but is very conflicted with anybody else. So we see this a lot. That because the, the people somehow think that this means that the dog is, is making judgments, but it's not. It's just that the dog, while the dog was going through its growth phase, it learned, to, uh, it learned who was trustworthy. And then it stopped. Um, we also have something else that occurs that is not at all relevant to fear, which is that after a dog is two and a half or three or thereabouts, it closes its circle of friends. Okay, so a lot of times you get a dog that was happy-go-lucky, this was wonderful, I like everybody in the whole wide world, and then they hit social maturity and it shuts down. And from there on out, anybody who is a stranger, anybody who is an another dog, they go, no, it's going to take me a long time to know you. So those are the dogs that I have one of my sayings about, which is, that those kinds of dogs, they should never meet for the first time. They should always meet for the third time. It's like adolescent dogs should never go on the first half of their walk. <coughs> Only the second half, where they're way more under control. So, in actual fact, I have ways to do that as well. So, at any rate, um, that is a, these are really common things where the dog starts to like somebody, then the person goes away, comes back, then they don't like them anymore. The, uh, this healer I just saw that bit the person who said, nobody ever bites me. Um, when we got to the property, the dog was in the car and was just absolutely territorial in the car. Just was scary in the car. And she said, shall I let him out now? And the dog is like, bah! all over the place. And I said, do you think he'll do anything? Here I am going, <clears throat> okay, right? And no, he won't do anything. He'll just run right up to you barking, and then he'll stop. <laughs> Okie doke. <laughs> so I had my assistant stand behind me because they're not paid. And, you know. <laughs> and the, uh, so the dog comes running out all the way up, actually hit me right here, and then stopped and looked at me. And I'm like, okay, I'm standing here. I'm being really good. I'm just going to stand right here. And then we very slowly moved around the property, and then we went in the house and we, when we talked. So we, we had a you know, long discussion about what the dog was doing and all that kind of stuff. And they, they kept saying their dog was wonderful and the best dog they've ever had and that there was something wrong with the trainer and blah, blah, blah. And I went outside and as soon as I went outside, boom, 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 same thing happened again. Dog had been very friendly inside. As soon as I went outside, he became very, very aggressive again. Um, and he will bite again. It's just that these particular people will never listen to anything anybody has to say, so I just told them how to do some management, and that's what they'll end up doing. So these dogs are conflicted because, again, they want to like, they want to like you. They want to know new people. 
They want to. They want to trust, but they can't. They cannot take the leap. It just doesn't happen as, as soon as they get into a new environment. Sudden environmental change is a cause of a tremendous cause of fear-based aggression. Uh, essentially, that is when the environment changes, the dog becomes aggressive. If you have a fearful dog, you see this all the time. This would be a dog that you're taking for a walk. You walk around a corner, there's another dog coming, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 your dog is barking again, or your dog is lunging. Um, and, uh, or, or somebody, a jogger comes up from behind you, or a jogger goes just past you like this. Sudden environmental change causes a tremendous amount of aggression. It, I think, there's no proof of this that I know of, but I think what happens is the dog, the combination of fear, arousal, and predatory behavior kicks in. Because the, pred the predator in them is always drawn to motion, and obviously the dog is afraid of its environment. So I have a dog who's got, he's a bully dog, and so next or tomorrow I'll be talking about him a lot because he's a bully dog, but essentially he's got a certain amount of fear and a lot of bully in him. And going for a walk with him is problematic because even though he can walk right next to another dog and you'd never know he was aggressive, and you know, even, even though he looks really well trained, he is, if he gets sudden environmental change or another dog does something that he doesn't expect, he will get aggressive. So my walks with him are like this. You know, I'm always looking always checking out. I'm, I'm a walking scout and I do not talk to people very well when I'm a walking scout. Walking with him is like walking with a good buddy that you completely trust. No problem at all. So when I walk with Luke I have to be a scout and when you walk with a dog that ha gets, a, gets alert at a sudden environmental change you may never be able to walk you know listening to music or talking on the telephone. It just may not ever happen. Um, so sudden environmental change can be anywhere, it can be inside, it can be outside, it can be in a place that they're very familiar with, it can be in a place that they're not familiar with at all. And again, it can be some place, sometime when a person moves from one room to the other. Okay, so us. What do, what do we do when our dogs are aggressive or, and, and are, are afraid? Well, we have a wide variety of responses. One of them is when you have a dog that does kind of barky lungy stuff when it's afraid, you get very apologetic to the people who are, oh, he's never done that before, <laughs> except for about 15 minutes ago. But other than that, he's never done that before. <laughs> a lot of people get very angry with the dog, um, even though they know very well that the dog is not going to change if they get angry. Why are you doing that? You're doing that for the other people. So they've dog and you're doing it because you're upset. Um, so upsetness in, in a dog and a person ca will cause anger sometimes. Anger does not do any good to the dog at all. Um, and I don't, I think it actually does some harm, but it definitely does no good. The most common thing I find with people who have a dog that is like this all the time is that they feel betrayed by their own dog. They feel like their dog doesn't trust them and they feel like they're, they're put all this trust into their dog and it's just not coming back to them at all. Mystified, yes. <laughs> Why is my dog doing this? And so we, we sit here in a, in a room with 40 people in the heat and we go, why is my dog doing this? And that you know that the dogs are all sitting in their room going, why is my person doing this? No, they don't do that. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the, a stranger who meets a dog that, that is fearful is, um, they'll, they'll, some of them are very persistent and we know these people. The dog is barking and they go, oh, I'm really good with dogs. I'm really good with dogs. Let me say hi to your dog. And the dog's going, <laughs> like the dog in the last video that we said, and, and the person's going, oh, but if, you know, I, 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 they like me, you know. So they're going to come up and they go like this and they go, oh, I know I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to put my hand out like that. Do you know what happens when you put your hand out like that with a dog that's afraid? They go, oh, there's something to bite. Um, <laughs> Or they think that you're putting your hand over their head. Nobody likes to have their, a hand put over their head. We don't either. So if you really do want to meet another dog, a dog that's scary, then stand still and hold your hand beside you. That's a much better way to do it. So this persistent approach is, you know, a lot of times I end up talking to my owners about what they do with the person who's persistent, who says, oh, but dogs always like me, is you can say things, you can be really clever. You can say, well, I don't like you. <laughs> That will do it. 
you know. Yes, ma'am? Wait. Is it, if it's a real question? So, yeah. Here it comes. A lot of times I'll get people, a lot of times I get people to say, oh, my, I'm really, you know, I, I love dogs, blah, blah, blah. I'm really friendly, or my dog's really friendly, and I just go, I'm not back off. Yeah, that's what I mean. You can just say I'm not friendly. And it's, it, it's amazing. They will try to insinuate themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are, people are really interesting because they don't take, first of all, I think to give them their due, I think that when they go to approach a dog, if a lot of dogs have allowed them to approach, then they, are, they have the expectation that their, that their behavior is going to be acceptable. So it's like if you, have, if you see a dog fight and the owner of one of the dogs is standing there like this, you know, it's because they're surprised and they don't, they're not one of these people who actually can take action very quickly. So somebody who's coming towards your dog and you're saying, my dog doesn't like you, and you're, you're going back like this with your dog, you're putting your dog behind you, and you're going, no, my dog really isn't good with other people, and they keep on coming and coming and coming, you know, what I found to be the best thing to do is to go stop. It really is. Because people will not respond to your voice, but they will respond to your, to your body signal. And what I do with Luke now, because people will have their dogs off leash, is I actually hold my leash up like this. So it's really obvious that Luke is on a leash. And then with my other hand, I do this. And they, they actually take heed. I think we are better responding to the visual than we are to the verbal. So nowadays, that's what I've been telling my, my clients to do, is to not be verbal. Let's not engage with these people, because it takes a while for the brain to start to engage. Just say, you know, just go, just do this. And then you can say whatever you want to say. You can say, he's sick. He's got a strange inogenital disease. <laughs> if you want to do that, you know. Um, you, you don't want to say he's got rabies because then they get angry. You don't want to say he's aggressive because then they get angry. So, but you can say he's sick. You can say he's afraid, but I don't like to say he's afraid because people go, oh, poor thing. You know, so you don't want to say that. You can say he's antisocial. I usually say he's a jerk. <laughs> Pretty clear. You know, it's, he's a jerk. You know, so if you really want to come and meet my jerk, you go right ahead. Um, and he's only not good with dogs. He's, he's very good with people. He will actually knock you over and lick you all over your entire body if he possibly can. So... So the stranger, a stranger, those are the persistent strangers, and they're all things that you can do with them. For the fearfully aggressive stranger, they, you know, they get angry. They start yelling at you for having this dog. They tell you, why don't you train the dog? That dog should be killed. There's any number of things that they can say because they're angry, you know. And the only thing I can say is be zen about it. It's okay. They're saying things they don't mean and they don't know you and they would love you if they did know you. So just, you know, be zen about the whole thing. Or they get hysterical, which is about as bad as you can get. Um, a hysterical person will cause a dog to become hysterical, will cause the behavior to get much, 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 much worse. So with a hysterical person, if you're walking a dog that's fearful and you've got a hysterical person on your hands, back away, move away as fast as you can because your dog will get more aggressive with the hysteria. So many owners or guardians get very impatient with a fearful or anxious dog. They know there's nothing to be afraid of. The person knows there's nothing to be afraid of. But have you ever tried to reason with a two-year-old kid? You can't. It's impossible. They do not do reasoning. They're not there yet. And the same thing is true with a, with a dog of any age. You, cannot, you can't impact fear by getting impatient with it. You have to work on it bit by bit by bit by bit. So, you know, I, I have a lot of clients who say they're, you know, that they know that there's no problem and why doesn't the dog know that too? Well, dogs are not only place learners. We know they're place learners. They learn, you know, to sit in the kitchen but not in the living room. They, sit, they know to come in the backyard but not when they're out in the field. They know, they know to do things in certain places but they don't know to do them someplace else. But we can add to that. They are place and time learners. So they know when you're coming home for, from work, right? So they, they know all that kind of stuff. And it's in, very important for, you know, to, for a dog to learn by experiences. 
So say, for instance, you have a dog that is much worse in the evening. Anybody have a dog that's bad in the evening? That's really common. The dogs tend to be worse in the evening than they are in the morning, particularly right around dusk, when they cannot see as well. And also, their energy level is at its highest because that is when they would be hunting if they actually went back to their roots. They would be hunting at that point. So if you're going to try to help a dog get over it, if you're going to try to help a dog, one of the things you should do after you've already set some behaviors is you should work at dusk. And, you know, that can be difficult to do, to, to go, okay, this dog is bad here, and now this is when I should be working it. It's not just where, it's when. And, again, very difficult to do. Um, and some people just want their dogs to get over it. Now, this is, is, the, is the kind of slave owner, you know, um, way of looking at things. I don't want the dog to be afraid, so therefore it should just not be afraid. And, you know, I get mad at the dog. So there's not a lot you can do with that. Um, I had one client I was working with um, a couple of weeks ago where the woman was really good. Uh, the husband kept saying, but I want to walk my dog in the neighborhood. And I go, but you, your dog is scared to death in the neighborhood, and every house that it goes by that knows the dog is there, it, it barks and lunges at that house. And he wants to go on this walk twice a day. And the dog barks and lunges at each one. And so the dog has been practicing this now for a couple of years, and so the dog's got it perfect, just absolutely perfect. Practice makes perfect, right? And I, and I said, you know, can you vary your route? But this is the route I want to take. <laughs> Do you want your dog to get over this? Yes. Okay, so if I told you that one of the ways to have the dog get over this was to start varying your route, would that help? I want to take the route I want to take. And finally, I just said, you know, we've been here talking for about an hour and a half, and I've been coming up with an idea, idea or two, and every time I come up with it, you say, that's not what you want to do. So either you take my advice or I'll leave, <laughs> because this is, it's, it's, you're not doing yourself any good by just saying, but I want the dog to do this. And yet, that is something that a lot of people do. I want, then you're going to have to get a different dog, because this dog is not going to do that. This dog is too afraid to do that. I don't get quite that, you know. I'm much nicer. <laughs> I, re I really wasn't as nice as I could have been with this guy because he was driving me crazy. But So, modifying the behavior of fearful or conflicted dogs. Um, remember that fear is not under the, under the control of the conscious brain. You have to communicate to the dog. You have to communicate what you believe to the dog, and you have to make the dog feel safe. Safety is also always from the mind of the dog. All right, so here you are. You're going to train your fearful dog. You stop thinking about the dog entirely in the very beginning of your training process. You have to be ready to learn. You have to have, you have to be one of these people who are sitting right here going, I am ready to learn. And most people with their dogs are not really ready to learn because they think they're teaching the dog. But really you're teaching yourself and the dog. It's the two of you learning together. So you have to be curious. You have to use your critical thinking skills. This is really important. If, if you are actually, um, you know, if you're walking around the block every time and, and, and the dog is getting worse and worse and worse, one of your critical thinking skills should be telling you, maybe I shouldn't be walking around the block every time. Maybe I should be walking someplace else. You need to be very flexible. You need to not be locked in on anything. So one of the things that people tell me they like me about, a lot like about my consults, is that I usually sit and think for a while as I'm listening to people, and then I come up with ideas that are completely attuned to their lives. Not to the, what I think their lives should be, except for the walking around the block thing, um, but what, what their lives are like. And so your flexibility is really important. And experimentation is also very important. So there are a couple of exercises that I like a lot in, in working with fearful dogs. One of them is find it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But sometimes that just doesn't work. So for instance, I was working with three chihuahuas the other day. One's a minpin chihuahua, the other two are chihuahuas. And the, the, the minpin chihuahua is very fearful and, and barks and lunges at other dogs. I can't use 
to find it with that dozed arc because as soon as they all start finding, searching for the same thing, they get into a fight. So I don't want that. So we had to come up with different, a different plan for, the, for their behavior problem. So being, being willing to experiment, what does this dog need? In fact, if you ask yourself that, that's a very important question. If it's what, if your dog or your client's dog or whatever, what does this dog need to make him feel safe? Sometimes it's pretty obvious. Sometimes they, for some dogs that are really, really, really fearful, what they need is not to go on walks. I had a client who had two mastiffs that had been totally unsocialized for the first 10 months of their lives. And then they, these people adopted the dogs. And whenever the dog was walking down a street, the dogs were walking down a street, and they saw somebody, they would do their very utmost to get as far away as possible. These are mastiffs. So guess what happened to the woman? She's being dragged along wherever they are. These dogs would go under fences, over fences, any, any place to try to get away from somebody who's just coming. In the end, what he decided, they had, they had a nice big yard, that she could get a treadmill, and play with the dogs in the yard, and that would be their life, and that they would be happy for the rest of it, and I bet they were. Um, but they, we had to be willing to experiment and willing to be flexible with that kind of stuff. So the things that make your dog feel safe are knowing that you will make your, uh, make your decisions, or that, that everything is under control, that you're the one who makes decisions. But it's not just you knowing that that's the case, they have to know that too. They have to realize that. And so when you're talking to a trainer or you're a trainer or whatever and you go, well, we're going to set these rules in place, like whether it's NILA for whatever it might be, the reason you're doing that is not so that you can make the dog into a little automaton, a little robot. The reason you're doing that is so that you can be fairly obvious about that I am setting the rules in this house. So I go into a lot of homes and they have the dog is free feeding. The dog is not fat. And they don't see any reason why the dog shouldn't free feed. Well, the only reason not to free feed, there is no reason if, there, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If the dog is a good dog and is not causing any problems, then he can free feed all he wants to. But if the dog has issues, then free feeding is probably not going to be a good idea because the dog needs to know that you are the great hunter and you are the one who goes out and shoots down the kibble. <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, you know, so anyway, <laughs> if they know that, then, they, then that puts you in a position of power. If you're in a position of power and then you tell the dog, you are safe here with me, you have more credibility. So maybe we should be calling it that. When you're trying to re, re, you know, reinstitute your, your relationship with the dog, it's because you're actually increasing your credibility with the dog. They're now going to start believing that you're the one who can actually make decisions about them. So they need to know that the environment is under your control. So there you are walking with your dog, you're just trundling along, everything is fine. You see another dog coming this way and your dog occasionally goes, they lock, load, and lunge. And you go, ah! Look like it's really under control, does it? No. She stood up, I'm supposed to stop. <laughs>